Well, good morning, everyone. I want to start by talking a little bit about geoscience samples. And the British Geological Survey manages a collection that goes back to even before the start of the survey in 1835. In fact, it actually, some of the oldest specimens that it uh, looks after were the Geological Society's own collection that were transferred to the survey in uh, 1911. The Museum of Practical Geology, 1851 till it was moved to South Kensington in 1935, was situated just over the road, 28 German Street. I think it's now a jewellery shop, part of Prince's Arcade. Perhaps we ought to have a pilgrimage there at lunchtime. <laughs> we manage the biggest collection of UK geoscience samples. And we have the facilities uh, to do it and a kit to get the samples uh, down. This is the new core store in Keyworth that holds the UK continental shelf material previously held at uh, Gilmerton and other seabed samples. We have about 10 million specimens, well, well in excess of. How many specimens is a borehole? It's, it's really um, up to your definition. Um, just to give you an idea of the spread, you can see mineralogy and petrology samples, a lot particularly in Scotland, central Scotland, uh, paleontology not so much there, geochemistry, and of course, borehole collections as well. We have online uh, 130,000 130, high resolution images of the core from the UK continental shelf hydrocarbon wells, freely available. We have more than 160,000 thin sections of rocks, both plain and cross polars, from across Britain, again, all freely accessible. We also host the GB3D, the type uh, fossils uh, website that has many of the type fossils in most of the institutions uh, across the UK. So you can search for any particular fossil that has a type in the UK and you can access <coughs> new high resolution photographs. And you can also in many cases download 3D digital models, so you can print your own copy of, in this case, a type ammonite. So um, our main collections databases have been online for well over 10 years, some almost 20 years, and that's both text searching and GIS interfaces. It's certainly a big collection, but it, the question is, is it really big data? And my view is that at the moment, it isn't yet, because most of the use has been to access information about individual specimens. So having the data online, having these large data sets, and we're talking about terabytes of data here, if you include the images, having all that available has certainly <coughs> increased the usage of the collections, but as yet, it's not actually been put together and been used in sort of big data analysis. We've had a few people looking at some of the images, looking at image analysis to try and relate that uh, to uh, petrographic terminology. <coughs> There's also been some interest in the online uh, core photographs, and we are keen to work with people, um, but as yet, I can't say there's been a lot of use of what we <coughs> currently have online. So we've been looking at other means to raise the profile and uh, utilize what we have. And quite clearly within the collections community, there are similar databases attached to most of the repositories, most of the museums, most of the major collections across the world. And what's happening, those individual databases are being aggregated into international databases. So for the rocks, we've been working with IGSN, the International Geosample Numbering System, and we are now the UK issuing agent for numbers. So it's quite simple. We can simply take our existing samples, we prefix them with UK, and they will uh, in due course be on an international database. 
much more readily accessible. On the fossil side, we've been working um, with the uh, GBDB, the Geobiodiversity Database. This is the Chinese database, which I'm going to talk about now for the rest of the presentation. So the Geobiodiversity Database is online, freely available. It's now the official database of the International uh, Commission on Stratigraphy. It's been developed in the Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology, NIGPATH. And the, uh, it's really the brainchild um, of Professor Fan, who is in the audience and is going to talk more about it uh, on Thursday at one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, workshops. Now, we've been working with the NIGPAS team, the GBDB, I'm going to call it, uh, team. They actually, as a pilot project, had a team at BGS from November 2017 until January this year. This is Dr. Fan, Professor Fan. This is the result uh, of the pilot project. It's it's a new interface of the BGS data held on the Geobiodiversity database. It's making more of our data more accessible. So what have we actually done? Well, a large amount of our fossil data is held in a series of uh, fossil, of stratigraphy technical reports. These reports, they're actually a fairly structured text so for every entry, there tends to be a locality, a grid reference, a list of fossils, taxonomic nomenclature, and probably uh, a conclusion as to a, a biozone. So it's ideal text, in fact, to explore for data mining uh, and AI use. What's actually happened in the project so far, they've been, uh, the Chinese team have worked with us to get more of these reports, which at the moment are just paper reports uh, in filing boxes, to get them scanned, captured digitally, indexed, and in due course, they will all be available online. So in the, this present project, uh, they actually scanned 1,775 reports. And that adds to uh, about uh, 2,000 reports that we had already scanned ourselves out of a total of uh, about 15,000. Then in the Geobiodiversity database, there's a number of tables. I'm not going to go into the details again. Um, Professor Fan will uh, be available to talk about that later. Um, but the key one is, one of the key tables is that of the references. So in this case, uh, we're talking about 13,000 reports in total. And then sections. So they, what's happening is, at the moment, the Chinese team are going through the scanned reports and manually, at the moment, extracting the sections. Because the Geobiodiversity Database, its particular power is in the fact that it deals in sections. It relates collections of fossils uh, to each other. Um, it comes back to this comment about geography. Uh, those bits that are closest are probably the most important, most closely related. So we're looking here at the analysis of sections. And in this case, uh, so far, uh, the Chinese team have identified uh, 1,205 uh, sections. And they enter them on the GBDB database, they code for the, uh, the various formations, the lithology, and the various faunal lists, the list of uh, fossils. There's an immediate benefit. This can feed directly through to Timescale Creator to produce annotated logs. TS Creator is available free online for anyone to use, but uh, the GBDB database links directly to it. You, can also, uh, you will also be able to do simple searches uh, for particular fossils, particular 
localities and see the results when the, uh, this link is uh, launched online. But we are particularly uh, impressed with the GBDB because it has a lot of additional ways of <coughs> analyzing the data. So here's just one example. Because you're coding not just the fossils, but the lithologies, the thicknesses, it's fairly straightforward to, to get outputs in terms of thickness variations, in this case, contoured of a black shale unit. And I know you're probably thinking straight off, could be interesting in shale gas work. Similarly, because you are encoding uh, fossil communities, lithologies, you can use that in interpretations of the paleogeography and the reconstructions. GBDB also links to the SCOTES paleo maps. So if you want to plot your data um, on um, paleo maps, you can do that as well. You can plot up uh, sp species richness, section richness. You can do a variety of statistics on the data. And we think probably most important of all, the GBDB links to CONOP. This is a multivariate graphic correlation. So because we're dealing in sections, within each section you've probably got a variety of fossil species present. Within those sections you'll have the first occurrence, the last occurrence, and you can effectively correlate between sections on the first and the last occurrences. If you've then got uh, other features, maybe a bentonite with zircons that's datable, uh, maybe magnetic reversals, CONOP uh, as a, a, a multivariate graphic correlation program is able to pull all this together and give you a best fit. Even an isolated collection um, that's not part of a section still tells you that certain species are associated with each other at a particular point in time. And this technique has already been used, uh, particularly in the Lower Paleozoic, uh, for improving um, our chronostratigraphy, biostratigraphy, uh, very considerably. So we think that this is really the future. We have this vast amount of data that's been amassed since 1835. We know by making the catalogues available, it's being well used, but we think that getting it into some of these big international databases will be the way forward by enabling occurrences of both ours and others across the world to be used in these far more sophisticated um, analytical approaches. So uh, we think, certainly for our paleo data, this will be the future. Thank you.